Uh, happy Sabbath, and I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, this time for this uh, Sabbath school time. And um, we are at the we are actually um, getting close to the end of this lesson study. And the title for this week's lesson, lesson thirteen, is the judging process. The memory text is for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things while well done in the body, whether good or whether bad. And uh, before we get started, though, um, I want to open the floor for anybody that has any testimonies. Anybody have a testimony? You know, I, I want to praise God, um, you know, just for this week for, for the blessing of um, the friends that we have here in um, Virginia, I remember there wasn't, it wasn't that many years ago. Uh, we had a, we had a hard time, you know, finding and keeping friends that weren't moving away. So we're blessed with uh, our community that's here. And um, I guess I just want to thank the Lord for his goodness this week. Mm. Um, I actually do remember a testimony I have. Um, my brother is not a member of the church, and but he knows the right things to do. And a um, couple of weeks ago, I was praying, you know, because the way the things are going in the world, it shows me um, that time is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So I was praying and you know, he has gone through some health scares, which will cause him to start reading his Bible and praying. But as soon as he gets better and feel good, he goes back to his old way of life. Mm. So I was praying and I'm telling God, you know, that I know he doesn't want my brother to be lost because he doesn't want any of his children to be lost. And I say, the burden I feel for him, I know you feel it even greater. So I said, I asked the Lord to open his eyes again. I know you've given him so many chances, open his eyes again and help him to see and understand, help him to see and understand with his heart and with his mind, your goodness, your graciousness, how much you've given him time. But um, to make a long story short, I was worried about him because I hadn't, he, we don't speak very often, but whenever I ask him a question, he answers me via text. And he didn't, I was worried about him. So um, I text him a, a couple of days after I sent the first one and said, are you feeling okay? I just want to know if you're good. <laughs> and he texted me the next morning and told me, He's feeling weak on his left side mm. and he can't stand up and he can't walk. So I say, go to the hospital, get up and go to the hospital. So the long and short of it was he had a stroke. Yeah. Had a stroke. And while he was in the hospital, um, being assessed for the stroke, I ask the Lord to give me the right words and the right tone of voice because I don't want to be condemning. I don't want to be lecturing. So I told him, you know, this is the third time through your own lifestyle and your own habits that you've had a serious health condition that could kill you. And I said, what will happen if you die now? I said, God has been calling you all these, these years and you've been doing your own thing, saying your own thing, living your own life. You need to make a change now. You need to make a change now. You need to answer him. He's been gracious to you. Um, if you die now, when he comes, that will be it for you. But if you live your life and guide your children along with you, you know, you could inherit eternity. So he told me, yes, I know. And he... You know, he, he's, he's, he, he's out of the hospital now. He's out of the hospital. He has no weakness, no deficits. Um, he's doing well. His blood sugar has gone up. Um, he loves bread. <laughs> so that could be why his blood sugar is up. But I just want to praise God that he has given him another opportunity. 
and um, that my brother is being even more responsive now. And hopefully by the power and strength of the Holy Spirit, he'll keep on in the direction the Lord is leading him. And I want to thank God and praise him for being so gracious in giving him another opportunity and pulling him through this next illness that the Lord didn't visit upon him, but my brother through his own living visited upon himself. So I, I praise God for mm. that. Amen. That's an amazing uh, testimony. I want to praise the Lord because one of my uh, colleagues, uh, I've been praying for him and, you know, he, um, I guess he, he kind of stepped away from a job. It wasn't going the right way. And he kind of been out of work for a while and he was praying to get a job in Houston at a specific school. And uh, I, it's interesting because I texted him on Wednesday or Thursday, I forget. And he let me know that he was, he had just been thinking about me 30 minutes ago. And I came to find out that he um, had been offered a job in the city that he wanted to go to. And uh, he thanked me for his friendships, for my friend, thank me for my friendship. And I just praise the Lord and then uh, pray that I can continue to be a witness in that capacity. And then another friend of mine, you know, just uh, praying for him, he got engaged. So it's just been a good week in terms of just seeing the people that you care for the prayers being answered and um like heather says you just pray that these things can be uh, a testimony for these individuals about how loving god is and, and good god is and that they make a decision to follow him yeah. okay yeah. without further ado who would like to pray oh actually heather yeah. you're praying to open yeah. this. or is it heather or i'll pray Okay. Yeah, I Go was going to ask for a prayer request. Um, oh, yeah, prayer request. Do any prayer request. Sorry. Yeah, um, I just want to pray for a friend. Um, her, her daughter is um, 16, and she is stepping out on her own. So just blessings for her um, and her ventures. Mm. Okay. Any other prayer requests? My brother. Yes. Okay. 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 All right, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Almighty Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We ask you please to forgive us of our sins. And we just want to praise you, Lord, for inviting us into your presence because you have told us to come boldly before the throne of grace. And Lord, we thank you for being in our midst because you have said wherever two or three are gathered, you are in the midst of us. Thank you for being within our midst, Lord. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we ask him to read our hearts and to present our prayers and praise to you in a manner that is worthy of your holy name, that it will bring a sweet smell into heaven. So, Lord, we praise you and give you the honor and the glory. We thank you for being patient, for being kind, for being gracious to us and showing such mercy. We thank you for Samuel's friend um, who received a job in a place where he was asking and we thank you lord for the other friend who has been blessed with a soulmate and we ask you please lord that you will continue to look down upon them and bless them and guide them and we pray that as you do these things in their lives lord that they will see your power and your grace working for them which will lead them to give their hearts and lives completely to you Lord, we thank you that my brother is recovering, that you have brought him through once again. Thank you for your patience with him. And we ask you please to continue to work on his heart, continue to open his eyes so that he could see and understand that this world is just father for fire and that he will embrace you and eternity. We ask you please, Lord, for others who are in similar situations like him, who have heard your gospel, who have heard that good news, that they too will take up their cross and follow you, knowing that this world will soon be put to nothing, but you have prepared something even better than we could imagine for, for us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And we ask that as we open your word and look upon judgment and the love that's shown in your judgment, that many will reject the lies that Satan has said about you 
and cleave to you. Is my prayer in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to begin our lesson on Sunday. Oh, yes. I, I forgot Lindsay's request. <laughs> okay, we can we can always pray again. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Heavenly Father, we ask you please to be with this 16-year-old girl as she goes out on her own. We know that this world is not a safe place, and we pray that strong angels will attend her, that the Holy Spirit will be her conscience and her guide, and that she will make wise decisions. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thank yes, you. very, very important prayer, yes. So we're going to go to Sunday's lesson, the final judgment. Okay. Now it's interesting because judgment, oftentimes when we associate uh, with the word judgment, it seems like it's negative, but it can also be positive as well. And so this lesson will kind of touch upon the two different ways in which we see um, the gospel, the, the, the way Jesus refers to the judgment. And there's two long passages. And so I want to ask the group uh, it's Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Who would like to read that or summarize that? It's the sheeps and the goats. Um, I could read. Okay. And then, Lindsay, could you read John chapter 5, verses 21 through 29? John chapter what? John chapter 5, verses 21 through 29. Sure. And as um, they are reading, I want those that are listening to think, how did Christ point to the concept of both condemnation and vindication in the final judgment? Okay, Sister Heather, if you can read for us. Okay, uh, Matthew 25, um, chapter, chapter 25, verse 31 to 46, and I'm going yeah. to read. When the Son of Man comes in his glory with all his angels, he will sit on his royal throne. The people of all nations will be brought before him, and he will separate them as shepherds separate separate their sheep from their goats he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left then the king will say to those on his right my father has blessed you come and receive the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world was created when i was hungry you gave me something to eat and when i was thirsty you gave me something to drink when i was a stranger you welcomed me and when I was naked, you gave me clothes for to wear. When I was sick, you took care of me. And when I was in jail, you visited me. Then the ones who please the Lord will ask, when did we give you something to eat or drink? When did we welcome you as a stranger or give you clothes to wear or visit you while you were in jail or sick? The king will answer, whenever you did it for any of my people, no matter how important they seem, you did it for me. Then the king will say to those on his left, get away from me. You are under the God's curse. Go into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm. Uh, mm. I was hungry, but you did not give me anything to eat. And I was thirsty, but you did not give me anything to drink. I was a stranger but you did not welcome me. And I was naked, but you did not give me any clothes to wear. I was sick and in jail, but you did not take care of me. Then the people will say, Lord, when did we fail to help you when you were hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in jail? The king will say to them, whenever you fail to help any of my people, no matter how unimportant they seem, you failed to do it for me. Mm. Jesus said, those people will be punished forever, but the ones who pleased God will have eternal life. Wow. Okay. There's a lot okay. in there. Okay, go ahead. Are you ready for me to read John yeah, chapter 5, verses 21 through 29? Mm -hmm. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the father, father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, 
and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they shall and they that hear shall live. For as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Mm. Okay. The question again is how did Christ point to the concepts of both condemnation and vindication in the final judgment? So was the judgment all bad or was it all good or it depends? I mean, it depends. It, it's, it's clear reading in John that it's Jesus that's doing the judgment right? Mm -hmm. And um, from what Heather read in Matthew, it definitely looks like people are judged at least to some degree by what they do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in John, it looks like God, God has his people and then there are those that um, are not his people. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah I mean, go ahead i think when we read these verses now we it may seem that it's good or bad but i think when we get further into it um it will seem that it's all good the judgment is all good because mm. god is coming to reign he's going to put an end to evil and um for those who live under his banner have, as him as their king, it's good. But for those who hate him, those who embrace evil, it will be good too because they wouldn't have to live with him. He will put an end to them. So for them, it's good also because mm. for them to live in his presence will be torture. Mm. Yeah. So for, for them, it's, it's good too. You know, he's not going to keep them around to torture them forever. So that's a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I imagine what, um, if my daughter were to pick all the things that we would do, like if she had her own birthday party and she got everything she dreamed of, everything would be pink and it would be sparkly and everything would be soft and squishy. And it would be, exactly what she wanted and she would be over the moon at least for a time and yet mm -hmm. if you take someone else and you were to put them in that same situation with those same activities and they didn't love those things they would be miserable mm -hmm. and I think it's that same thing or even you know something as simple as someone that you love you enjoy that time with them and someone that hates that person is not going to enjoy that time and I think that's the same thing with God. Yeah. You know, people that are his friends and those that are not. He won't force anybody. Mm. So they're happy to not be with him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So there's this interesting because there's a lot to think about, but we were limited somewhat by time. So the thing is, if we're saved by if we're saved by grace through faith, why does Jesus seem to point out what we do when it comes to distinguishing between the wicked, those that end up with Jesus and those who do not? Where, where do our actions play into this? I think it's hard to identify and just say, okay, well, this one loves Jesus and this one doesn't love Jesus. Well, how do you know? You know, you can't, you can't see someone's heart and thoughts and mind but you can see the choices that they make you can see really what they love and who they are by what they do 
Mm. So my question is, okay, but God knows everything. So why does he, why does he, if God knows everything, why does he, why does he need to point out whether somebody does something or not? Well, I would say, because we don't. And okay. I'm, I may look at someone and think, you know, that's a really good person, but I don't know their motives. I don't know their heart. Mm. Because another script here, you know, he told the sheep and the goats here that the sheep did this and the goats didn't do that. But in another scripture, he also said some people did good things, but their motive, their motivation was wrong. Their heart was mm. wrong. They did the works, but not for the not because they had a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm. They did the works out of their own self righteousness. But I may know somebody who is doing everything, and I think, oh, this person is slated for heaven. You can imagine mm. how many stars they're having their crown. And when I get to heaven and they're not there, I'll be saying, well, where is this person? Mm. The judgment is for me to see the, the righteousness of Christ's character, to see the goodness of his character. And when he makes, mm. when he makes a decision, how right and just he is. That mm. way, when... Um, when everything is reset and everything is made new and perfect again, sin will never rise up because we have seen and we have understood. Mm. I think to me, we need to step back and think about the God we serve. What kind of God allows himself to be accountable to his created beings like that? A God of love. A God of love. But God is not a dictator. He's not a tyrant because he could just say, you know, in some of these countries, well, I just want him in this position. Why? Well, because I like him. I mean, that happens. That happens in organizations. Unfortunately, that happens in churches. That happens in, you know, countries, corrupt countries. So why is the God of heaven saying, OK, let's look at all, let's look at all this stuff? I mean, to be fair, he has every right to just judge however he chooses to judge. Right. Mm -hmm. And we should just trust him, but he does it that way. And I think love is the key there because imagine it was your brother or it was your mother that was not in the kingdom and you were confident that they mm -hmm. should be there. I think it would be hard not to question at some point is that is that really fair is god just mm. um and so because he wants us to be able to love him freely without reserve and without fear i think that's that's the the only way to do that to remove all question from people's minds yeah so, because if if we end up in well when we end up in heaven amen 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 and we go down those golden streets and around one corner, we come to Hitler. Right. Oh, he yeah. Had, we gotta, we gotta, I got to get back to the books. Let's get back. To a, he had a last minute conversion, just like the thief on the cross. You know, he right. sincerely in his heart before he died and he ends up in heaven. You know, you come and you come face to face with Hitler. You'll probably look around and wonder, am I in the right place? Unless right. the Lord has opened the books and he showed you the judgment of his heart, you know, what he, you know, why he's there. Hmm. So again, the works, the works, the works is not information for God. It's information for finite beings. That's the point I'm trying to get at, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, so it's, an, it's evidence for finite beings to see what, what's going on, but it's not the basis per se of our salvation because the thing is, we need Christ's righteousness and his works to stand in our place. And then those works are evidence that we've accepted that. We've accepted the life of, we've accepted Jesus Christ as our savior. And um, because we've accepted him as our savior, because we believe in him, right? We've repented, then our life will, our life will demonstrate that belief. And we believe in a faith that works. So yeah, it's an interesting, interesting uh Thing, but I just wanted to get that out there because sometimes people can be confused and they think, well, no, you're saying that you're saved by your works. As I know, 
It's like your works are your evidence of your salvation, though, you know, or not. Because we have so, evidence in the Bible of many people who did no works. And right. Not. Right. You know, That's so true. Yeah. The thief on the cross, all he did was believe at the last minute. And I think in our heart of hearts, we know that true love has action. Right. right, that's what it comes down to, true love. You wouldn't expect your spouse to be cheating on you and then say, oh, but I love you. No, that, that's not the right love. Or, you know, parents that abuse their children. Oh, but I love them. I just, you know, I get angry mm. or whatever the case may be. No, we know that our actions are linked or are linked to right. love or not yeah. love. Yeah, to our choices. Yes. It, remind, it reminds me of uh, the story. We, we knew a couple where uh, the lady, uh, the husband was taking money out of the bank, you know, and she oh, just yeah. would not, and she would not believe it. She's like, my, my husband would never do this. And she was upset and blah, blah, blah. I think she went to go get a withdrawal and the, the bank, the, the thing was empty. And she was like, no, my husband would never do this. Blah, 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 blah. But then... They had the video and the video showed him doing exactly what they said he was doing, you know? And so th there, there, there's some, there's evidence, right? For decisions, you know, even though they knew the truth, they still had the evidence to show, Hey, no, this is what it's like. Mm. So, for, so for her to see, you know, because I think what we forget is that heaven is a community. It's not like there's uh, there's other there's angels there's other created beings and so I think it's interesting that we realize that okay there, it's a community of people that God is saying are are fit and they're healthy to join the community so Jesus is really saying hey, I trust in you and I believe in you and therefore look look at how they live they're ready for the community you know so and here's and here's the evidence for that. And so I think that the judgment really is a, is, a, is a blessing because it's a demonstration of what God can do in man and what uh, when we have faith in him, how his Holy Spirit can work through us. And then that's what the, the judgment shows, that evidence of that. Albeit it's not the, the price because none of us can live a perfect life. We need, that, we need that life of, we need the perfect life of Christ, but it's evidence of what happens when we believe. Yeah. So it's interesting. Anyway, the pre-advent judgment uh, we have a few verses. Um, who would like to read Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14? I can read it. Uh, and then we have uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Who would like to read that? I could stick with Matthew. Okay. And then uh, I'll read uh, Revelation chapter 11. I'll do the Revelation verses. Okay. Okay, who would like to read Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14? I have it. I beheld until the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and all people that all people nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed mm. okay matthew chapter 22 says once again, Jesus used stories to teach the people. The kingdom of heaven is like what happened when a king gave a wedding banquet for his son. 
The king sent some servants to tell the invited guests to come to the banquet, but the guests refused. He sent other servants to say to the guests, the banquet is ready. My cattle and my prize calves have been prepared. Everything is ready, come to the banquet. But the guests did not pay any attention. Some of them left for their farms and some went to their places of business. Others grabbed the servants, then beat them up and killed them. This made mm. the king so furious that he sent an army to kill those murderers and burn down their city. And he said to the servant, it is time for the wedding banquet and the invited guests don't deserve to come. Go out to the street corners and tell everyone you meet to come to the banquet. They went out on the streets and brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. And the banquet room was filled with guests. When the king went in to meet the guests, he found that one of them was wearing the right kind of clothes for the wedding. He found that one of them wasn't wearing the right, right kind of clothes for the wedding. The king mm. asked, friend, why didn't you wear proper clothes for the wedding? But the guests had no excuse. So the king gave orders for this person to be tied hand and foot and to be thrown outside into the dark. That's where people will cry and grit their teeth in pain. Many are invited, but only a few are chosen. Mm. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 says, Then there was given me a rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18 says this, and the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, and sounds and peals of thunder, and an earthquake. And a, and a great hailstorm. And then, Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, very famous passage, very important. And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and the springs of water. So how do these passages shed light on the notion of the pre-avent investigative judgment in the heavenly courtroom? What is the significance of this judgment? Mm. What's the significance of the judgment? Or what, what can we learn from these passages? Well, it sounds like... Um... There is more than just humans and God involved. It sounds like there's mm -hmm. a, a yeah. courtroom with witnesses. Mm -hmm. That's true. Other creations. That's true. I'm sure. Anyone else? Um. From, from what we read, you will know who, is, well, we'll be separated into He's the be... and the unjust before he comes. Mm, that's true. So we would, mm. it's not like when he comes, we'll have a chance to do anything to change our character. Um, when that's he true. comes, our, our choices are sealed. Hmm. It says, and the nations were, were enraged and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bond servants, the prophets, and, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And so it looks like there's a time, there's a time came for the judge, for the dead to be judged, and the saints to be rewarded. And then verse 14, right? You see, you see a warning 
the hour of his judgment has come. So come worship him, right? And uh, I like this, like you said, clearly that there's a, there's a judgment that must be had. There, there's a judgment that comes before the separation uh, between those that are going to be with God forever and those who will not be in the presence of the Lord. So Any it's other almost thoughts like on God this? is God has made the judgment, and then, um, and then the second judgment is. Um, I guess people and everyone else looking over the books and seeing God's God's uh, judgments and deciding whether they, well, I guess deciding that He is fair and He is just mm. um, with the judgments He made. Right. So there, there's that level of God. There's a level of other the the un, people looking and seeing what's going on. And, you know, I don't remember which text it was. It did talk about um, Jesus, Jesus calling, you know, and um, we know that his sheep hear his voice. So, you know, he, you know, calling the dead, the righteous to, you know, to life and the unrighteous, you know, to, to death, but almost mm -hmm. like the very fact that they know him identifies which which um whether they're they're um saved by his grace or guilty by their own works yeah that's true what does it say i was gonna find it i'm gonna find that verse but okay hmm any other thoughts on the investigative judgment? You know, it's funny because it seems like it's everywhere. It makes sense that if 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 God is going to come and bring His reward with Him, that a determination must have been made before. Even in that uh, the parable when uh, um, that Heather was talking about before the party got started, the father was going through the guest guest list, and he said, "Oh, you're not wearing the right garment." Now, see that. That has always made me stop and wonder, how did they get there in the first place? What is, what is that talking about? Or that they were just wanting to bring out the fact that we need to have Christ's righteousness. We need to have his garment, not our own. Right. He, and here's the thing. He probably, probably either he didn't take it seriously or he thought this was good enough. I think that's the point. He thought that it was good enough. And there's many people today, and you hear that that kind of thinking, well, you know, I don't need to be, I don't, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to, you know, necessarily have an intentional relationship with Jesus Christ. I can just I'll just be in heaven because I'm a good person. I just do good things. But that's not that that's not good enough. You know, my righteousness is just filthy rags. I need Christ's righteousness. So I gotta accept that garment. I think that's the deeper truth, like you're pointing out, uh, Lindsay. But you see that there's an investigation of those that are there that have accepted the invitation, you know? Okay. Tuesday, the millennial judgment. We kind of referred to this uh, beforehand. Um, who would like to read? And the question is, why should the saints participate in the millennial judgment? Um, who would like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3? I can do that. Okay. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are mm. you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? Mm. I'll read Romans chapter... 20 verses four through six, it goes, then I saw thrones, they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received the bark of their, on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead 
did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And then verses 11 through 13, that I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open, and other books, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged according, every one of them, according to their deeds. Mm. So again, you see this corporate judgment. Why should the saints participate in the millennial judgment? I think Heather kind of touched on it. Why should we participate? Why does God give us the privilege of participating in it? We know he's, um, he's just. We could see why he made certain decisions and understand for our understanding. We could see that um, based upon the things he has done, the accusations that Satan has made against his character are invalid. Mm. You know, I think also because it shows who God is. Hmm. And I think it's, I think it's like, it's a revealing of God to his people because it helps us to understand him and know him in a deeper way. And I think God wants to be known by his people. That's true. Because we, we've been, we are walking by faith. We are walking by faith, not by sight. And in some things, when he gives us the sight, it deepens our faith. So I right. think this is giving us sight into why certain things have occurred and why certain um, decisions were made, why certain um, opinions were formed, why, why certain foundations were laid. So I think it's mm. in a site where we could have even greater faith because we, we, see, we see the horror of sin. We see right. how many opportunities God had given people that they said, no, I don't want to live for you. I don't want, I don't want to have any part with you. And we have seen how um, Satan, you know, even when Jesus is coming back, and he, he acknowledges that Jesus, you know, all the sinners will acknowledge that what Jesus is, is correct, is true. Yet they hate him so much that they still think they could overthrow him. You know, the, the mystery of sin and what it does to your heart. Mm -hmm. So I think he has to reveal all of that to us so that we could, because we, the Lord has withheld so much from affecting us. Because if he didn't stand between us and sin in a lot of places, we will be de destroyed because sin mm. in itself is a destroying force. And he had to let us see sin walking around naked so that mm. we could understand how destructive it is. And I think in, in, in the judgment, we get to see what people have done, what he has held back, how he has stepped in see his love and see his character so that we can understand so that sin will never ever rise up again because we have seen how mm. horrific it is and how because of sin god we nail god to a tree mm. even while while he did that and we understood what god was doing for our in our behalf we still reject him mm. you know, we, you know you you said something there. Um, we walk by faith, right? 
at this yeah. point, we don't understand why things sometimes happen in this world. In fact, a lot of times we don't understand why things are the way they are, why things happen. Um, just, you know, things in the world. And I think mm -hmm. God is going to be answering those questions in the judgment. Mm. I think we'll understand, you know, why, um, why people made the choices they did and the consequences of those, cha those, those choices resulted in. And, um, you know, God, he wants us, he, he wants to be able to answer those things for us. So, I yeah. mean, the judgment, it'll be a solemn time, but in some ways, I think it'll be a very healing time. Yeah. Mm. You know, the mother who wondered why their child didn't live after all the prayer and fasting for their healing. That's very, very true. You know, we'll be able to see and understand that. Mm. And, and praise God for allowing the child to die because we'll finally see what he saw that we couldn't understand. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's true. Hmm. It's interesting. It says, and the and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books. And so yeah, we get to see these things. We get to we get to uh, understand why they're not here and uh, come to uh, come to a place of peace. I mean, to me, it's just amazing because God, you could God, God argue God doesn't have to do that. You know. He yeah, he didn't. Why should he have to do that? How many of us are like that? You know, just being completely, tr just being transparent with, hey, these are, this is, this is, this is what it is. Yeah, you because, because, you know, sometimes you are a supervisor. You're a supervisor over like four employees or five or whatever. Right. And, you know, you'll tell them to do something and you'll say, well, why do we have to do this? And I said, because I said so. If you, yeah, don't, I said that too. <laughs> if you don't like what I said, there is the door. <laughs> Sounds know? like parenting, right. except there's not the door. <laughs> yeah. But but for God, God, who is so much bigger than anything we know, he, he has no beginning, no end. He, he is all powerful. You know, we're not even a worm compared to him. Mm-hmm. Yet he is going to explain himself to us so that we could understand why he did certain things. He could just stand up from heaven because I said so. Mm -hmm. That's true. But he, because he is love, he wants us to understand why he did certain things so that our relationship with him will grow stronger and deeper. So That's strong true. and so deep that we will not look at another besides him amen that's beautiful uh, okay let's move on to wednesday's lesson the executive judgment um and it talks about the executive judgment as god's final and irreversible punitive intervention in human history and it kind of goes through like kind of the process of what's what's happened uh rebellious angels adam and eve the great flood um, Ananias and Sapphira. So you see God intervening in human history. Um, uh, who would like to read 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6? I can read that. And then who would like to read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13? 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13, I'll take. Yeah, 10 through 13. Okay, go ahead, Linda. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses what? Four to six. Second Peter chapter two verses four through six, and Second okay. Peter chapter three verses ten through thirteen. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And mm. second, 
Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13 says, The day of the Lord's return will surprise us like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a loud noise, and the heat will melt the whole universe. Then the earth and everything on it will be seen for what they are. Everything will be destroyed, so you should serve and honor God by the way you live. You should look forward to the day when God judges everyone and you should try to make it come soon. On that, mm. day, the heavens will be destroyed by fire and everything else will melt in the heat. But God has promised us a new heaven and a new earth where justice will rule. We are really looking forward to this. Mm. So it says, how do these texts help us understand the nature of the final executive judgment and how do they imply the idea of the completion of judgment as opposed to its ongoing uh forever which would be a perversion of justice and not an expression of it so how does this understand the judgment how does this what what's another character of the judgment do you see finality mm, finality yeah, you know, in um, Second Peter chapter two or four, it says it's talking about um, how God spared not the angels that sinned; He cast them down to hell, and then He said, "Delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto the judgment." You know, it definitely shows the timeline. Um, I think that was the second part of your question. Um, it shows the timeline of the fact that um there's there is a judgment and it's at the very end god is waiting for everyone to make their choices um mm. and um so even though it says they cast them to down to hell they are in chains of darkness waiting which is here on earth <laughs> mm. Interesting. And so there's a finality to it. So the thing is, it's not like God is going to be burning people or he's been burning, you know, let's say he's been burning Hitler uh, from 1944 all the way until now. And then he's going to continue to eternity. Right. I don't know if Hitler's and I don't know if Hitler's going to be uh, <laughs> lost forever. I don't know that knowledge, but I'm just making an assumption. So, but some people would believe that he's already he's punishing it and he's going to be in there forever. I mean, he did a lot of bad things, but forever, forever and ever and ever. Well, um, I have two, two things that makes that not make that premise not sensible. If we say Hitler is burning because of the things he did, anyone who has done anything wrong has been burning. So that means Cain has been burning for 6,000 years because he killed one person. Right. right. Which will make God very, very unfair. Oh, that's a good point. I never, I did what you're saying. And if, um, and if there is a place in the universe where people are burning and screaming forever and ever and ever, then us in the universe with these people wouldn't be in heaven. Because let's say my dearly beloved uncle goes to hell for something that he did. You know, he, he, he rejected God and he's in hell. I'll be here knowing my uncle is burning and burning and burning and burning. And it wouldn't be heaven for me. It wouldn't be a mm. earth for me. Because even though the Bible says that God has wiped away all tears, there will be no more tears, I still could feel. So I'll be there heartbroken and can't cry for my uncle, right? And think about <laughs> God, right? Those are his children. Yeah, because yeah, he loves- yeah, I think to me that's interesting. He loves each and every one of us with the same everlasting love. It's true. And some of us he is going to bring into his house because he loves us. And some of us he's going to destroy because he loves them because he know it will be pure torture and hell for them to live with him. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know if any of you have ever met a person 
and you don't know why, but you just don't like that person. Every time you see that person, <laughs> you get upset. Yeah. For, for no apparent reason. They just rub you the wrong way. Right. That magnified a million times is what the unsaved person will be feeling in the presence of the Lord. Every time True. they see him, they want to kill him. They want to destroy him. They want to destroy his people. So him getting rid of those children is out of love. So they wouldn't have to mm -hmm. suffer from that type of feeling, that type of anger, that type of hatred anymore. Mm. So having them around burning forever. Can you imagine seeing your children, your creation that you love so much, just burning and burning and burning through all eternity mm. as an eternal being? You know? Right. I like what you said. I never thought about that because what it is, is if that's the truth, then it minimizes, right? It kind of minimizes. Well, you know, whoever you kill one person, you kill six million. It's all the punishment is the same because after eternity, it all becomes the same amount of time, you know? No and you know, it just seems like it would take such a very, to believe that about God, he would just really be a horrible, he'd be, hor he would just be a horrible God to, to really have that be the solution, you know? And I think to me, that's, that is what uh, makes it the clearest to me is that if this right. is a God of love, then he can't, he can't be putting people through that. Yeah. Right. He spent 6,000 years trying to convince us that he's a God of love. And at the end of 6,000 years, okay, I'm going to burn these people forever. Right. And I think also too, I think also too, what's interesting is uh, those individuals still have eternal life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's it's a miserable eternal life, but it's still eternal life. And and the Bible also says there will be no more sin. And if these people are still around for eternity, there is still sin for eternity. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. The second death. Okay. Let's uh this kind of continues the what we were talking about in terms of uh, burning forever and ever in um, that judgment. Uh, who would like to read uh, Malachi chapter four, verse one? I can read that. Okay. Uh, who would like to read Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15? I can read that. Okay. I'll read Revelation chapter 21, verse eight. Okay. Starting with Malachi. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day mm. that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Mm. Mm. Completely gone. Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm. So hell and death are also consumed. Yeah. And Revelation chapter 21 verses 8 says, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. To me, either, either, either is death or is not death, right? When we go to, you know, when we go to somebody's funeral, we don't expect them to, we don't expect to see him at Kroger tomorrow, right? I'm not trying to make a light of funeral, but you know what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say, or either it's death or is not. Or to still be breathing or in a coma. Right, exactly. You know, it's either it's death or death. And so it makes it very clear that the lake of fire, it's a complete destruction, a final destruction. Um, and to me, that uh, that's the that's the sign of a merciful God, because like Heather said, if you know, it, could you imagine us forcing people to like, you know, I think a lot of people don't come to church now. Right. Imagine if it's like, OK, well, sorry, 
I got to pick you up and take you to church. That's what God says, man. We just, I'm sorry, we got to worship him. I know your whole life you didn't worship him, but we're in heaven now. We all got to worship. That'd be the worst thing. Or like the Inquisition, convert them at the end of a sword. Right, exactly. You know, well, it's either this, it's either, it's either worship God or it's the other place, you know? That, that doesn't seem like that's free will and that's choice. And um, for, for people um, who read the scriptures and read the, the, the scripture that talks about the dead burning forever and ever, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to say that forever and ever, um, like how we say, and I, I, I remember there was a little girl at church that told me, when are we going to eat? I'm starving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> said, are you starving? She said, yes, I'm starving. I haven't eaten in forever. <laughs> right. And I said, are you starving or are you hungry? <laughs> she said, no, I'm starving. <laughs> so for some people, for when we use the word forever it's it's a term that we use to to um connotate the long period from the beginning until it ends right it was forever you know for um for somebody who really has to go to the bathroom and there's somebody in the stall of you in, in, right. the stall in front of you it takes forever for them to That's come very true. you know mm -hmm. so forever in relationship to all the other scripture that says there will be left neither root nor branch and that shows you that Sodom and Gomorrah had eternal fire and, they, and Sodom and Gomorrah is gone, so there's no evidence of it. Eternity just means until it comes to an end, until it comes mm -hmm. to an end. So what, what would, uh, so this is an interesting question. What would be wrong with the idea that God saves everyone in the end? Why is that such a bad idea? There are people that do believe that eventually everybody will be saved. Yeah, but not everybody wants to be with him and he's not going to force anyone uh, that, to be with him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because uh, it will have to be like a communist regime. You know, he brainwash everybody or he, he has everybody there under duress. You're going to mm. be with me no matter what. You know, it's like a rape of the mind. You know, you, right. you, you'll be with me no matter what, because I want all my creations with me. And right. people, people in this world make a stand and say, no, I don't want to be with you. Some people right. say, I don't want to be with you. Some people said, I want to be by myself and do what's best for me. And some people say, you know, I choose Satan. I choose the great deceiver. You know, mm. so. I mean, I think even the idea you know, if you're forced into a marriage, even with the perfect man, you don't want to be forced into the marriage, you know, and that's, that's, that's how Jesus describes his people, right? As his bride, you yeah. don't be forced into it. If you've done, sure. if you've made your choice in this world and you've made it clear with your actions, then why, why, why would a God of love force you into it anyway? Yeah. And I think this kind of comes back towards as we wrap up this conversation. What's the, you know, how do we view the character of God? And then again, God says he's love. So then the question is, how do we view what love is? And I think, you know, unfortunately, some people believe that love means that God can never do anything where somebody wouldn't be with him type of thing. Uh, but the argument that we're saying and in, in from the Bible is that people have their choice to choose and demonstrate whether they want to be with God in this one life that they have. And it's, you know, you have the word, you have the Holy Spirit, you have all these, the heavenly intelligences, angels working, trying to convince people to come to God. And people are going to make decisions that they say, no, I just don't want to do it. You know? And uh, like everyone has echoed, I don't think we should, I, I don't believe in forcing people, you know? to make that decision, you know? And, and God's love, in order for you to be a recipient, for you to um, benefit from his love, 
you have to accept it and behave in a certain way. Because mm. if, you, if you accept his love, like Lindsay had alluded to earlier in the in the study, when um, a husband loves a wife, that doesn't mean that means he doesn't go out cheating anymore. Mm -hmm. You say because God is love. In order to benefit from His love, you have to accept it, right? right? So when you accept it, then in the acceptance of it, it makes you do certain things, which means I don't go cheating on him anymore by wandering mm. into the world. So if because of his love, you're going to enter into heaven, it's because you accept his love. And in the acceptance of his love, it changes who you are and how you behave towards him. Mm. That's true. That's true. And so our lifestyle manifests and manifests that acceptance of Christ, Christ's life on our behalf. Yep. And then the judgment is not just something that's happening in God's mind. It's community. Yes. It's looking on, which is interesting, right? To me, that's, that's completely fascinating that an all-knowing God with perfect knowledge and judgment would allow other people to see um the lives of other people and say okay you see this is what i've determined look look do you see for yourself that's well, amazing the consequences of sin is so unlike what god wants mm. because sin and our and the destruction of the unrighteousness is not what god wants because he doesn't want anyone to perish but it what will happen because of our choices. So sin and its consequences is so, for want of a better phrase, mind-boggling to the rest of his creation that mm. to let them see everything unfold. That's true. Because what, what will make the creature rise up against the creator? You know, hmm. the creator who spoke worlds and universe and galaxies into being. What makes us think we have the power to defeat him? Hmm. You know, that, that is what sin does. That is what sin has done. Hmm. Rebellion. Yeah. And it's it's a mystery. It's a mystery. So hmm. the judgment has to occur so that everyone, including us, can see how deadly sin is because That's it's true because sin builds nobody up sin just destroys everyone yes yeah. and then how power and, and on the flip side how powerful how powerful god's grace is yes yeah because you, you could you'll see in people's lives how individuals that were living one way they've accepted jesus christ as their savior and they're living another way a complete transformation yeah. and so god so so we so the universe can see that as well yeah you know to me that's amazing and so god's not just doing the judgment in some corner in some room somewhere and then he just comes out and says okay this is the list you guys good with that you know and and the, the greatest evidence of sin i think is jesus christ mm. because jesus christ you know people say oh yeah i'll die for my brother but God didn't die for his brother. Right. The creator died for his lowly creation. Mm -hmm. He stepped down and he became put on human form and remained in human form. Because mm -hmm. I remember when I was a child and I learned that Jesus can't be omnipresent anymore because of what he did for us. I was shocked. Mm -hmm. I said, what? Yeah. He can't be everywhere again? If it was mm -hmm. me, I wasn't dying for them because I want to be that powerful still and be everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. But he gave that up for us. He put on humanity and kept it for us. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Right. It's true. So anyway. I can't even imagine having it, much less giving it up. Yeah. 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 That's true. What Man, we that's the. Yeah, and I, I don't, you know, it's funny. I'm looking forward as we conclude this. I'm looking forward to, in, I'm looking forward to being in heaven. That's the thing I look forward to the most, you know, being with Jesus, and then also being with believers and just 
just really like, you know, we're not limited by bedtime, but just thinking and talking about these things like, man, man, Jesus is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. You know, and well, it'll be, I think it'll be heaven because we'll just hear about all these testimonies about God's goodness and what he's done. And like, just, can you imagine the testimonies that just keep on going and going and going? And we're going to all be like, man, that's so amazing. Praise him. Praise him. Okay. Who would like to close? Lindsay, can you close for us? Sure. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath. Um, we thank you for our warm homes. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to um, learn about you, Lord. And it's just we think more deeply about um, who you are and um, the way you plan for judgment. Lord, we thank you, not just for your justice, but for your mercy and for the way that you love us, Lord. We ask that you help us. Um, to honor and love people like you do, Lord, um, that we might um, lead them and show them who you are and then respect their, um, their choices after that, Lord. We thank you for your example and um, we ask that you are with us, that you help us to um, to trust you with other parts of our lives as well um, so that we can have your perfect peace. We ask that you bless each set of ears that are listening this to um, this lesson. And Lord, we ask that you help them to also learn to um, know you more deeply. And we look forward to seeing you again face to face. We ask this, Lord, in your holy name. Amen. 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 God bless everyone on this. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.